I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Okay, guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Graham Medlin, who is a sub-fossil expert and honorary curator of sub-fossils at the South Australian Museum. Welcome, Graham. I'm pleased to be here. Um, now, I've got to ask straight up, what is a sub-fossil? Well, I get, the, I get that question asked quite frequently. How, how does it differ from normal fossils? And normally uh, it's bo- bones that have been produced by animals, either dingoes or uh, tiger cats or barn owls or birds of prey, producing pellets and regurgitating the pellets on the surface. When insects attack the pellets, the pellets fall apart and leave the bones in the roost, at the bottom of the roost. Now, with subfossils, most of that material is not embedded in rock. It's loose material. There's only one other site I've had. Most of the sites I've examined have all been surface deposits. So it's been very easy just to extract the, the bone material. It's not embedded. I think the difference, important difference is it's not embedded in rock. And secondly, it's not an impression. Whereas often you get some of the very early fossils are just impressions in the rock. 600 million year old Ediacaran fossils are just impressions. There's not, they're not real bone. They're not real because back then there was no animals with backbones. So you don't have, the, don't have that sort of material. So what I deal with is mainly surface material not embedded in rock. Uh, usually most of what I'm working on now is bone produced by, from the prey species of barn owls. But there are other birds of prey as well we deal with. Uh, Letter wing kites are the other predominant type of pellet producer, but I prefer not to deal with those because they, they don't swallow their prey whole like, like barn owls. They tend to tear the flesh off the bone and swallow some bones and then regurgitate the pellet, but it's, it's nothing like a barn owl pellet. It's very hard to identify the material from a letter wing kite pellet. That's interesting. And just, just for those people that don't know, a pellet is, unlike a kookaburra or a tawny frogmouth that eats prey and then poos it out, um, uh, some, most of, I think, all raptorial birds, maybe they regurgitate the fur and the bones from their prey. Is that correct? Yeah, all, all birds of prey regurgitate the indigestible material in, in the, from the prey species. Um, that, that includes mainly bones and fur, but even, even animals like magpies, uh, starlings, they also regurgitate beetle remains and so on. You'll often find on the lawn, if you've had a lot of lawn beetles in your lawn and the magpies have been busy, you'll find a pellet that's predominantly the exoskeletons of beetles. So, and they, anything that comes out the back end doesn't include any of the bone or, or hair material. How did you get into learning about and studying sub-fossils? Well, that's a very long story. It all, I'm a retired school teacher. I taught in high, in high schools, a couple of high schools. But when I was teaching at Croydon High School, uh, a new teacher came in by the name of John Smith. And he was very keen on um, scuba diving and that type of thing and snorkelling. So he encouraged the senior students to do snorkelling on the, on the Ordinga Reef. Later he became the um, consultant in biology and his, he made the decision that it was important for teachers to get their students out into the field. But to do that, you had to train teachers to start with. So he organised a field trip to the Gawler Ranges um, in 1972, and I was just amazed at what we did. We did plant identification, plant adaptations, insect collections. We encouraged to write poetry, did bird watching, the whole gambit, and even went out to Lake Ackerman and looked at the holes in the surface of a lake to dig for beetles in in the surface. And I thought, this is fantastic. I I must get my students out into the field. So in 1973, I organised for some of the staff to go up to Chambers Gorge in the Flinders. And I'd been there in 1965, uh, before when I bought my first car. Not a good place to take at that stage. The roads roads were terrible. I came back with a dented muffler and all sorts of problems. But... uh, so I thought Chambers Gorge would be a good place to take students. It's remote. There are no shops or anything like that that the kids can go, go into. No Coca-Cola for them to go and buy. And so we took the staff up there in late 1973 
and we decided, can we do exercises in geology, biology, geography, uh, and chemistry? And we looked at potential activities, wrote, wrote some sheets that we could use for hand out to students, and said, yep, this is a goer. So in 1974, we took our first trip to Chambers, and uh, that was the year that Lake Air flooded. So we had the environment up there was the best it's been for a long, long time. It was incredible. There were Sturch Desert P that was six metres in diameter, <laughs> the biggest Sturch Desert P I've ever seen. And the follow-up year in 75 was also a good, good rainfall year. And Chambers actually had three years running where it had good rainfall, but potentially in 74, a lot of rain. And that first year we, we climbed Mount Chambers, we had the students doing all the activities. We had chemistry, soil pH testing, we had water analysis. We did all of those things. It was practically orientated towards the courses we were doing at school. Then in 1976, I continued to do these trips. In 1976, some of my students climbed into a cave at Chambers Gorge, where they shouldn't have been, and came back with a handful of bones and said, Mr Medlin, what's this? Hmm. And Mr Medlin had absolutely no idea, <laughs> because I was a chemistry, so I'd gone through Adelaide University as a chemistry specialist. So um, I, I spent the next 10 years climbing into every cave I could find so from 76 to 86 at Chambers, I investigated lots and lots of caves and found many, many uh, areas where barn owls had actually been using the caves as roosts and discovered to my amazement that, in fact, uh, there, was brush, there used to be brush tail possums at Chambers Gorge. Not in trees. Their remains were in caves because they're adaptable in the arid zone. They can live in, they can live in caves. So that was, that was a first for me, but uh, from the material that I collected, barn owl pellets from the caves plus the bone, I got an invitation from Kath Kemper at the museum to work for 12 months to analyse all this stuff. And so in 88, 89, I spent 12 months at the museum, took leave from teaching, and uh, identified 10,500 individual animals from the collection I'd made. And... Uh, in that 10,500 animals, there were 27 species of small mammal that were native, had been native to the area. 27 species, plus the house mouse, which wasn't, in, wasn't there in large quantities. And the house mouse, many of the deposits I actually excavated, or took the material out, had no house mouse whatsoever. So it had to be pre-European, and that was, that was a good indicator. So that's how I got started. A chemistry specialist suddenly ending up looking at bones. But it was just so fascinating that I continued to do it. That's, and that's what I'm doing now. That's, <laughs> that's life-changing, isn't it? That is, that is, that is, that's incredible. And what I really admire about you, Graham, is the fact that you're an expert in these things. And here you are today, we're at Science Alive, and you're still engaged in teaching younger people, trying to invoke in them a fascination and an interest and a curiosity about science and biology and all of these things you've got a um lots of beautiful images out there and you've got some uh, specimens and a lot of bones and things for kids to look at and touch and hold and i think it's fantastic i think it's important to get young children interested in science and that's when you look at the age the age range from tiny tots right up to teenagers it's important to keep them enthused i mean i've been a member of the field natural society since 1979 um where once i started the chambers gorge expeditions up with the students I decided I should get more expertise in how do, how do you identify mammals in the field because up there you see yellow footed rock wallabies, you see euros and the occasional western grey but uh, so I decided I joined the mammal club and this was when Peter, a- Peter Aitken was the curator of mammals at the museum and he had started a project at Kaipo Forest to um, com- the Woods and Forest Department were going to do a controlled burn through a native forest area. And Peter said, hey, wait a minute, let's find out what's there. Before you put a fire through, let's find out what's actually there. So the Mammal Club got involved and we, it was very, very demanding because we actually had monthly, monthly surveys for nearly three years up there. Um, and unfortunately, Peter died in 1982, but we started in 79 into 80, 81. Peter died in 1982. And by, in February 1983, the, uh, the wildfire went through that terrible uh, Wednesday on the February the 16th, I think it was, 1983. The wildfire went through the area and it just totally wiped the area out. But we had the data before, because they'd done 
control burn so we had pre and, pre and post control burn data and then discovered what happens For doing this burning doesn't make any difference if you have a wildfire it just totally completely stripped the area there was nothing it was just the firestorm was so strong it actually took the ash off the ground there was no ash on the ground it would just disappeared so we're talking the difference between more of a winter controlled burn versus a summer hot burn originally they, they intended to burn in autumn when the sting had come out of the temperature but in fact the first control burn they did was actually very it turned out to be too wet so they had to do it again in September of the same year. So that was the beginning. Yeah, and it's very hard to control these burns, unfortunately. But the wildfire came quite independently of the control burns. So that meant we then followed... We used to follow up after the control burns, we used to follow up the ringtail possums as well. We had um, spotlighting possums in trees. We'd number every tree with a special fluorescent tape so we knew which tree the possums were in. We then noosed them out of the trees with a long pole with a noose on the end and took them down and gave them a, and coded them, gave them a number, we ear punched them with a code that told us what the number was. Then we released them again so we were able to say, you know, how territorial are the ring tiles? Are they sticking to this, these areas or not? But once the uh, wildfire went through, of course, there's, the population was completely destroyed, completely burnt out. So that's, that's why I got involved with the Mammal Club, because I wanted to add to my skills to be able to do work at Chambers. That's, I first met you on a survey on the Air Peninsula on Shio Kill, and the Herp Club were there, and I met you representing the Mammal Club. Yes. We were catching uh, Spinifex hopping mice, I remember. You were telling yes. me how to sex them. Um, it's not not we, too difficult. Not too, no, that's right. I, yeah, um, <laughs> I had no idea at the time. That's like 15 years ago. Yes. Now, I think. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of a lot of people come along, got involved. Um, yeah, uh, we we took my mate's son with us, and it was a great opportunity for him to get involved. He was really excited because mm-hmm. he found uh, a species that wasn't on the list yet. It was a, a red tarred worm lizard, so he was pretty excited that he got to add to the the species list for the the tally for the survey. So that was exciting. Um, and it was Easter, and I, and I remember that because uh, somebody had gone along early, taken the animals out of the pitfall traps and put Easter eggs in there and said to the kids, <laughs> go in there and um, check the traps for us. Or did they? <laughs> oh, did they? Mm. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would have been in the 1980s? Um, or was it 1990s? It, it, it would have been after 2000, actually, because oh, that Dion Granson was with me. We studied together in 2000 when we first met. Okay. I think Dion's come in and done some work with you, hasn't he, in the museum? That he did many years ago. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I haven't kept up with contact with what Dion's doing at the moment, but he had the most, for an amateur person, he had the best natural history background that I've ever come across. He must have done a huge amount of reading. I was he really impressed. Was amazing. We'd all be playing hacky sack on our lunch breaks, and he would be in the library looking at, like, whoa, they've separated this species of cat into this, and he was incredible. Um, he is now a park ranger at Two People's Bay in Western Australia. So, and he's responsible for, for the world's most, uh, sorry, Australia's most endangered mammal, the Gilbert's pottery. Right. Uh, oh, that's that's right up his alley. That's very fitting because he. You know, I'm really pleased for him. That was really good. So as a result of the field surveys with the Mammal Club, we decided we'd start doing field surveys on some of these conservation areas that had been bought or started by um, people like um, the Bon the Bon, bon Station, uh, which is Bush Heritage, the Bush Heritage Australia. Yep. Um, so we've we've done two surveys now on Bon Bon, and that, there was a really massive owl pellet deposited in one of the shearing sheds. There we got 300 pellets out of out of that and that that was modern material it wasn't old material but our first trip to um we'd done surveys at Wichelina. this is really interesting because we went there and initially after the scientific expedition group had set up had had a pit line set up there so we followed the year after then we went back in 2007 and then we went back again in 2012 and none of this material had ever been worked on so Bull Kamata Station was one of the more, most interesting areas that I went into because we wanted to find out what animals used to be there before it had been taken over by Bush Heritage Australia. And, and the first, well, in one of the first surveys we did there, let's say in 2007, it was a drought period, completely eaten out. It was really in, looking in bad state. 
just within a kilometre of the homestead, there are, there's a rocky outcrop with lots of caves in it. They're all quartzite-type caves, they're not limestone caves. So I said to some of the people with me, I, Peter Matichek came up with me, um, let's see what we can find. And so we went in there and showed, said to Peter, now there doesn't appear to be anything in this cave at all. But with the angle on the, on the side, you've got areas opened up in the, in the rocks like this, the overhang tends to protect any hour pellets that get dropped that end up on the edge there get protected. So if you dig right up against the edge of the rock face, so we took, we took the soil away and started exposing bone. We even found a complete skull of a brush-tailed possum. Oh, right. Wow. So on wow. Bulkamata, they used to be brush-tailed possums, but they weren't living in trees around the river red gums. They were living in caves, living in caves near the homestead. This particular site, the Bulkamata site, ended up uh, giving us 14 species of small mammal. Wow. And, and most of those are now no longer in the area, but there's Bollum's mouse is still there. And the, the last time we surveyed there was in 2012. We actually caught for the first time the dusky hopping mouse. Oh, OK. Now, that's commonly much further north. I've gone through hundreds of barn owl pellets from the areas east of Lake Frome and further north that have been collected by different expeditions up there from the Waterhouse Club. But to see it at, at Bull Kamata was just fantastic. It means that it's, it used to be a rare rodent in South Australia, and I'd have to say that I don't think I can consider it to be a rare rodent anymore because it's reached as far south as Bull Kamata, so it's, it's doing all right. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, because for those that don't know, Bull Kamata Station, it's uh, not quite south of Broken Hill... And it was a sheep station. Um, they've taken the, the, the grazing pressure off it. Um, it's being managed. It was grazed from like a, an inch from its life, and now it's actually coming quite good. And there's an amazing diversity there. It doesn't look in places very diverse. Um, it's got some very open saltbush areas, and there's um, there's some woodland areas. And there's some some dry creek beds. And it's not until you do some of these trapping expeditions. We spent two weeks up there, and the amount of small mm. mammals and reptiles that you would otherwise never see was off the hook. Um, yeah, we found, talking about um, distributions, northern spiny tail geckos uh, were there, so that's got to be on the southern uh, peak of their range, so that was interesting. So you, you can let a lot. So somebody can bring in some pellets into your lab mm-hmm. there at the museum, yes. and you can tell all sorts of things about what used to live there going right back thousands of years? Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of the material I haven't had radiocarbon dated. I think one of the most interesting projects I got involved in was the excavation of a sinkhole at Venus Bay. In 1994 and 1995, I was still... It was near 1994, I was still teaching at that time. I retired in 95. But the uh, scientific expedition group had decided they wanted to take the youngsters, the teenagers... Uh, first of all, chasing wombats, doing a wombat survey further north. <laughs> and then they were going to end up at Venus Bay. And I'd found out from uh, one of the rangers working up there that uh, he'd, found a, he'd found a sinkhole with bones around the top. And what had happened, it was a narrow slit about 60 centimetres long at the top, and it was just enough to be able to squeeze down through the hole. He found this cache of bones on the top and it turned out the farmer who actually owned the property originally had put a drill down into the, into the sinkhole to try and get, see if he could get water to water his stock. But of course, being limestone, there was no, there's no way. It was just porous. It, just, there's, it didn't hold water. But in those bones, we actually found some, some remains of thylacine. Wow. So there were post-cranial remains, not, not from the skull, but the other bones. So I decided I'd go back, and when the expeditions were, expeditioners were there from the scientific expedition group, I was able to uh, show the expeditioners what it was like. And there was, it was just ideal. It, you had a whole big hole. I could stand in the hole at the bottom, and I had in front of me all this soil, which had been washed in over many thousands of years, mixed with charcoal because of the bushfires that regularly went through the area, so we had all the soil mixed with gypsum, charcoal, etc., full of bones of animals that had fallen in it. wasn't It was not a, an owl roost; it was a pitfall, it's a pit, pitfall trap. So it, it came down and then ballooned out. So if you got stuck in there, if, if we had a, a long-handled spade at the top with a caving ladder on it, if that spade had fallen off, 
we couldn't we couldn't have got out. It was <laughs> impossible. So we're able to just stand there, and, and I divided the layers into two centimetre layers and excavated a fifty centimetre strip. And then we later on we were able to ex- dis- take out the uh, charcoal. And so we knew at each of the different levels, we had we all we dried the charcoal, weighed the charcoal, knew how much charcoal we were getting out of each level. We had radiocarbon dating done on the charcoal in at least five different areas. And we were able to say from one area, from the radiocarbon dating, that the thylacine was there in, two, in three 3,000 years beforehand, 3,000 years ago. And that seems to tie in pretty well with the idea that the dingo by then had moved from northern Australia down into the southern part and would be a predator on the young of the thylacine and the thylacine disappeared. It seems to be 3,000 years seems to be the, the deadline, the last time that the thylacines were available. So that's, that's interesting, and, and for anyone listening, a thylacine is the extinct Tasmanian tiger, or I guess that'd be a mainland tiger. Um, there's still some people out there that, that see it, so they say, and there probably always will be, uh, but so far no conclusive evidence has emerged. Um, incidentally, did you ever have anything to do with the Mundrabilla cave specimen? Oh. Okay. That's a, no, that was the one where the mummified specimen was. Yeah, it still has the stripes. And yes, yeah, I've seen photographs of it, but no, I had nothing to do with that. The piece of the thylacine that I found um, had just two teeth in, the, in a fragment of jaw, but that was enough to identify it as a, as, a, as a thylacine. I think it's amazing that you can have such a small piece of an animal, just a, a piece of a lower jawbone, and you can tell which species of native rodent, which species of small marsupial, you know. Um, it's incredible. Well, I've had nearly 40 years' experience <laughs> When I started with students at Chambers Gorge, you know, that was started in the 70s and now I've had about 40 years experience. It just, I can often look at a skull and say, that's how it smells. <laughs> you don't have to check that it's got a notched incisor or other character, characteristics. The, the first mole of a, of a house mouse is different. And even the lower jaws of a house mouse are totally different from any other native species. So you can't confuse a house mouse with Bollum's mouse or the sandy desert mouse, which is a similar size. There are about three species of mice, native mice, that look like house mice superficially until you look at their teeth. Yeah, OK. Uh, what we were told was when a, a native mouse versus uh, introduced a mouse, you know, the um, house mouse is in a pitfall trap, the house mouse will, will run around like he's crazy and, and they've got that smell to them. Only the males... Just the males. Just the males, not okay. the females. The females don't smell, but the males do. So that's a good... If you get a male, yeah, that's, a, that's a good indicator. But you're right, the be- behaviour in a pitfall, when we surveyed last, last year, the year before, in, at Gluepot Station, we caught a number of house mice, and uh, you look down on the pitfall, and yes, that, that, that mouse is tearing around all over the place. <laughs> it's a house mouse. That one's quite still oh, It's probably Bollum's mouse. You put your hand down and just gently lift it up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't get bitten. So the, the behavioural difference certainly between some of the native species and the house mouse. Probably because it's such an aggressive animal, the house mouse is a good survivor and it's been able to occupy the niches that have been left by lots of the native mammals that have disappeared. And he, had, he had to contend with cats in his environment where he originated from too, I guess, could have played a role. I could, that's, tr- that's true, Yes. Um, how do you go with like all these name changes? And there's, and there's been a heap more name changes. The, the new mammals of Australia is not, not out yet, but um, you know you spend all this time learning what this is and what that species is, and then they go and split them up and change their names. And how does that play into your work? Oh, I just have to because I'm getting old. Now. <laughs> you have to just make a note of it and think, well, I'll have to update that in the collection. <laughs> I mean, the, kang- the kangaroos are a problem because I'm still used to. Macrobus robustus for the Euro and Crocus phalangiosus for the Western Grey Kangaroo, etc. So, yeah, I haven't quite caught up with all of that. And the bandicoots, the, um, the Western barred bandicoot has now been split. That particular species, Paramelis bougainville, has been split into at least five species by work that's been done by uh, the one of the curator of mammals at the uh, West Australian Museum. So that's something we're just beginning to come to grips with. It's incredible. And also, we just, of, of the animals we found at Chambers Gorge, we got pig-footed bandicoot, rabbited bandicoot, western barred bandicoot, 
uh, we've got all those up there. But now Kenny, who's the person responsible for this, says, oh, I think your, spe- your species at Chambers Gorge is a new species. Uh. It's not <laughs> Caropus echordatus, which is the scientific name for the big-footed bandicoot. And he hasn't described it. He hasn't told us what the new name is at this stage. So... So that increases the Australian extinction record if they split it that does. guy. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I guess one of, the, <laughs> one of the most exciting things for me out of the Chambers Gorge work was actually finding a species that was totally new to Australia. Oh, really? And I opened up a pellet, looked at it, and it was a sub-adult. It wasn't a fully grown animal, and it was the skull of a... It was obviously a hopping mouse. I could tell that from the shape of the skull. I looked at the teeth, and I thought, there's something different about those teeth. It's not... a it can't be. There's the long-tailed hopping mouse and the short-tailed hopping mouse, which are two species that are now extinct but used to be present in Northern Territory, Western Australia, South Australia and New South Wales. Um, it wasn't like them. It's not, what is it? So I sent it across to rodent expert Jack Marnie at Sydney University and he came back and said, yeah, new species. Well, congratulations. So... That was the start of things, and Jack, being the expert, he, he was going to describe it, but he was a very busy man, and from the time it was discovered, which is 76, up to the time he died in 1982, it didn't get done, and then the next person who had, I'd had contact with about it was Meredith Smith, who was a, a specialist paleontologist working at, at the museum. She left it for 10 years, and... Uh, and then she unfortunately got leukaemia coming back from Africa who got sick and died. So only one person left and that was me. So, I, <laughs> so between the three of us we've described this new species and I did all the photography for the explaining how with the differences between the other two species of big hopping mice. So there, we, in South Australia there were originally two species of big hopping mouse, not the small ones, not like the dusky hopping mouse and the spinifex. Uh, so we've added now an extra, which is called the broad-cheeked, broad-cheeked hopping mouse. Oh, OK. It has one of the broadest areas of cheeks that I've ever seen in any hopping mouse. Wow. So, so that was exciting to get a, get a new species. It just had a long gestation period to describe it. So he, <laughs> from, that's an extinct animal? Extinct animal. It's only been found in South Australia. We've got quite a few sites in the Flinders, plus uh, out near the, towards the Davenport Ranges as well. We've got one specimen from there. So it seemed to be restricted just to that particular area of South Australia. OK. Yeah. You have to know what the habitat requirements are for the individual species. Sometimes we already know because they've been caught as live animals in the early days. Other times you have to speculate. The new species, we're not really sure whether it lived in sand dune type country or clay type substrate country at this stage. But one of the things I actually started to do, I got um, um, an arc map drawing program and drew a series of circles from the, from the Barnow Roost sites and, and went out in kilometre sections to find out how far you had to go out before you hit, what, what, was the, what was the habitat? Was it sand dune habitat? Was it salt lake or whatever? And I still haven't finished that project yet, but we're still trying to work out what the prime habitat for this animal is. It's probably going to be a sand dune animal, I think, but I'm, I'm not sure at this stage. But one of the other projects that I was involved in was um, in, the, in the Streslecki Desert. I had an, an engineer from Santos who was working for Santos come into the museum with a bag full of barn owl pellets and asked me whether I'd be interested in dissecting them and finding out what was there. And of course I would be. It was something that I, you know, was my main interest, but I said, well, look, if you're regularly, he was two weeks off and two weeks on. That was the sort of thing they have. They work for two two weeks straight and then they have two weeks off. Could you collect for the next twelve months all the pellets from this particular roost? Um, and he agreed to do it. So we got nine collections over twelve months from December 2002 to December 2003. And as a result of that I, the first lot of pellets I looked at, I thought, oh, I, can predi- I can predict what the habitat is. I hadn't actually gone to Google Earth, but it had dusky hopping mice, OK, longitudinal dunes. They're a sand dune animal. They build their holes on the tops of dunes and burrow down. But there were also fat-tailed donuts, striped-faced donuts, brown desert mouse. That was a desert, that was a sand dune animal. So I speculated that there would be longitudinal dunes and clay pans, went to Google Earth, 
put in the coordinates for the site, bingo. <laughs> There, there it was. So it's interesting. You can you can do this and work backwards and work out what the habitat habitat might be if you know a little bit about the ecology of the animals that live in the area in the first place. Did the diet of the barn owl um, change throughout the year? Oh, I should have mentioned that at the very beginning there was a very severe drought period, and initially the, the number of rodents in the diet dropped markedly. They were eating grasshoppers. I mean. The, Normally the barn owl has a very broad ranging diet. It can rodents are predominantly there mainly because I think it's the, the most common, the most common prey species because they produce more young, and there are more of those than any, anything else. But we had little marsupial mice as well, a whole range of other native mammals, but only in small numbers, and that was because of the drought, the drought period. And we we noticed that as the pellets started to come in the number of geckos that were being eaten, because geckos are a common prey species for barn owls, that the number of uh, gecko species just went up astronomically. And as the number of rodents being eaten dropped, so the, the number of geckos went up. And there was, I think, in the third month, the third collection that was made, there were 603 geckos out of about 89 pellets. Oh, really? And that was the predominant, predominant diet for the barn owl. That the only way they could survive was to survive on geckos. Then the monsoon came through and the drought broke and within a month the whole ecology had changed, the, the rodents had started to breed, the desert frogs had come out and suddenly the desert frogs appeared in the pellets, uh, the bird populations went up, so the bird numbers went up and so on. So we were able to correlate the, the rainfall with the change in the diet of the barn owl at the time because the, the animals they were eating, uh, their population started to increase until later on in the year the, the dusky hopping mouse was one of the dominant species. It's, uh, I mean, one, one dusky hopping mouse is a reasonable meal, but sometimes they could eat up to three. One pellet could contain up to three dusky hopping mice. Wow. And that's one night's feeding. That, you've got to remember that's one night's feeding. That's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> the bigger animals like the, the long-haired rats, at, they're sort of like a 100-gram rat or more. They're, the females are 100 grams, the males go up to 180 grams. Um, they're too big for a barn owl to swallow whole, so they decapitate the bigger rats. And you often get lots of long head rat skulls in pellets because the amount of material that, in the brain uh, and the protein in the skin and so on is enough to keep that barn owl going for one night's, that's one night's feeding. The rest of the body gets removed, they pull it apart and swallow it and regurgitate a couple more pellets over the next two days and there's one rat. It's enough food for three days. Well, it's a fascinating way to gather that information because, I mean, you imagine the expense of being out there on the field having to witness all these kills or to have to grab stomach contents analysis from an animal having to kill it. You're getting all this information by looking at its, its pellets. It's fantastic. That's not right. not harming anything, it's just... Yeah, the best way. You've just got to remember too, though, that barn owl, although barn owl analysis is very useful, that there are some animals that don't, that won't get caught by barn owls, because being nocturnal, and there, there are a couple of nocturnal predators, like the little winged kite is, this, is another one. Those those two animals up in the Streslecki Desert, the little winged kites are, are dominant predators, and their main item of prey is the long-haired rat. But there are some animals that are diurnal come out during the daytime so they never get caught by barn owls yeah the, the numbat you don't find those those in barn owl pellets because they're not nocturnal animals so that's that's one of the restrictions if you like on getting information from barn owl analysis um, well, luckily most of the small native australian animal mammals are nocturnal but there are a few that are not so you, you don't get them all yeah, it's interesting, so, but it shows you um, the ebbs and tides of the nocturnal species in that environment. Definitely. So you can learn a lot about an environment just from your lab without even going there, just based on these, these little pellets. Well, there's a project we're working on at the moment, and we've still got a few more pellets to finish off, from Wataroo in the pitlands, the, uh, the Adnamutna areas of the northwestern corner of South Australia. And at uh, this particular site, it's an Aboriginal settlement, We've done about three dozen pellets. We've got, three to, we've got about three to go. But it's disappointing to find that most, most of the animals we're getting out of the pellet to house mouse. So even one of the most remote Aboriginal settlements in Australia, the amount of degradation that's occurred around that settlement 
and this our roof site is within 5Ks of the, of the settlement itself, um, most of the native species disappeared. And that's, that's a bit of a problem. So too many house mice, not enough native species. Yeah, it's sad, isn't it? So what have you got on now? Are you still, you're still involved? You're at the museum. People still can bring in specimens to you? Or yes. have you got a backlog of specimens? Do you have many oh, I have volunteers? I have a very big backlog of specimens. I've got three <laughs> volunteers. Yep. My oldest volunteer is 89. She's vowed she's going to retire at 90. They all say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, hope she, I hope she makes 90. She's got a few medical problems, but the other two volunteers are in their 70s. Sorry, I, one of them's in her 70s, the other one's in her 60s. So that's really good. I mean, I couldn't do this work without volunteers. If you had to pay people to dissect barn owl pellets, um, it would be very expensive to do. That project I mentioned about the Streslecki, the Streslecki Desert took us two years to dissect 619 pellets with two volunteers who on work for the Dole Scheme and, and me, two years to dissect 619 pellets. Well, there's a lot of money tied up if you were paying people to do that exercise. But I can't handle more than three volunteers at a time. There's not enough lab space to be able to to do that unfortunately but there will be uh, time later on for people to volunteer when the different volunteers drop out and is there much interest from young people that want to uh, get into this field it's it's really hard to say <laughs> i don't see see enough when i was teaching i actually had my students dissecting barn owl pellets because um, i developed a course at Mawson High School, a field studies course for year 11 students that had SACE accreditation because I realised since I'd been involved for a long time with the Mammal Club and the Field Natural Society that lots of these children, lots of these kids just know nothing about their Australian native mammals. So I introduced a course and that included barn owl pellet dissection because I had access to that and I actually had one, one of my students tell me he went to Adelaide University because of the, well, what he'd done in my course. Oh, so that was, that was gratifying. That's, yes. That's, that's very cool. Yeah, that's good. How, do, how would people get involved now? Like with any of your field work or is there still possibilities for people to come out with you? Well, the field work, when I'm going out with the Mammal Club and the herpetology group and we're doing field work like this, at uh, Glupot Station coming up soon, we've got a survey in October, uh, anyone interested in coming on that needs to contact Peter Matichek, who's the president of the Field Nets. He's organising the trip. But um, if you just put in the, the uh, on the website the Field Natural Society of South Australia, you come up with their website, and that will have information about who to contact about uh, proposed trips and things like that. Yeah, that would be it's, it's, it's really good good way to start. This particular program we've got going at. Uh, glue pot this time in, is going to involve a lot of children. Someone else is taking up youngsters up there and we've encouraged them to come and look at our pitfall traps and what comes out. You just have to be careful. They don't get in first. <laughs> <laughs> they, get, they want to get down and take the animals out. <laughs> Snakes and scorpions. Well, well that's right. You've yeah. got, to, got to worry about that. So long as they're under decent parental control... <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably wasn't wise to put Easter eggs. <laughs> in there, in those <laughs> yeah. days. Good point. Yeah, good. But no, very important to get the kids out there. I think we had a, a very active member of the mammal club who used to collect ants because he uh, collect invertebrates for the museum on these trips, and he used to be a bit of a joker. And occasionally, the Easter eggs would drop into the pitfalls, or the the rubber snakes, or the rubber <laughs> lizards would get in there <laughs> to get the herpetologists and enthused and encouraged oh no it's this is rubber what are you doing to me sort of, sort of <laughs> name it sort as a species yes <laughs> that's yes, funny that's right oh, we've heard of um fantail wrappers being wrapped around uh oh, wombat, that? Poo. wombat poo yeah because they're cute <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's mean, yes. <laughs> mean. Yes. um graham thank you mate is there anything you'd like to add that um uh, about anything you're doing or anything that's happening and uh, coming up mate um, as part of Science Week, I'm going down to the Narragore Caves with museum people. There'll be a different people from different areas of the museum, and, and I'm still waiting to have a meeting with the with one of the people to work out exactly what I'll be doing. But uh, one of the areas I didn't have a chance to talk about was stick nest rats. So when I started working on finding pellets in caves at Chambers, 
it prompted me to think, well, I'd better find out how these animals are distributed right through the Flinders. So I started visiting a whole lot of different areas within, within the Flinders Ranges. And one of the things I got out, the geological map, I knew what the geology was like at Chambers where the best caves were, pinpointed the areas where the limestone was, out from uh, an area, a cave out from the Aruna Dam, that was limestone, had a student who's now doing her PhD at Adelaide. She worked, did her honours on the contents of the pellets and bones from that. That was really good to see that being used. Discovered, one of the other things I forgot to mention earlier, I've discovered that the, at Chambers Gorge the ghost bat was present. We've actually wow. got lots of droppings and, lo- and bones. I've got a complete skull of a ghost bat. They used to be within the Flinders. And when I first went into the cave at uh, the Aruna Dam, which was 1984, I found an area there where there was enough droppings from ghost bats that I could have filled a pillowcase. And the cave itself was obviously an old ghost bat roost. But I've deviated a bit from what I was saying before. Um, I discovered in a lot of these limestone caves remnants of stick nest rat nests. And associated with that, there was this black pitchy looking stuff. But the first stuff I saw was quite small. And I thought, oh, that's bat dung or something because at Morrow Gorge, I'd been to Morrow Gorge looking for barn owl pellets and bones, saw this stuff halfway up the wall at Morrow Gorge and thought, oh, what is it? Oh, it's probably bat, accumulated bat dung. And then I discovered from Peter Copley, who started doing a survey of stick nest rats, where did they have their nests and where were they before Europeans arrived? And he said, no, that's, that's amber rat. That's solidified, that's the solidified urine of stick nest rats. And what they do, they build their nests... There's an example in that figure there. There's the, there's the nest. They stand on the top of their nests and urinate against the cave wall. And over hundreds of years of generations of stick nest rats, you get this accumulation of amber rat. And it's an important material because, as you can see in that particular big uh, amber rat deposit from Bratchener Gorge, it actually flows. You can actually see that's flowed down from the, in the diagram like treacle. Mm. But it's also able to absorb moisture. When the humidity is high, it absorbs moisture, so it gets slightly damp. The outside of the, of the midden gets coated with pollen grains from the surrounding environment. And over hundreds of years, hundreds of years of accumulation, you can get middens that are quite large. There's one at Bratchener, it's a linear one that's about two metres long. Halfway up the cave wall, how did it get there? The the nests have gone, the sticks have been removed by uh, goats and by euros using the cave, so the sticks have disappeared, but the amber rat is still there. So I started documenting all of these sites with amber rat, and then I found there was a student at the ANU who was actually doing her PhD on the looking at climatic change. And I thought, well, how do you use the stick nest rat nest to work out climatic change well what she was doing and I told her about this nest this magnificent midden at Bratchener and she used that for her study she put a, she put a core through the midden from top to bottom and got radiocarbon dates from the organic matter in the which is embedded in the solidified rat urine and from the pollen grains that were also in there because it's a water soluble material it does, you can dissolve out all of that can be dissolved put it through a filter, you collect the pollen grains and organic matter, you radiocarbon date the organic matter, and for that core you know how old it is at that point. And from the pollen grains you can actually work out what plants are present at the time that the urine, urine was being deposited. That particular one that I've got in front of me here is, has been radiocarbon dated at 4,500 years, which is quite remarkable when you think about it. And next to that, in the same, in the same cave that I climbed into, is one that's 2,000 years older. Whoa. So she had this, and she's got this information, and she studied these middens at both Chambers Gorge, Bratchener, and Arkarula. So that was another thing. That was just a side, just as a result of looking for barn owl pellets and bones, I got involved with stick this rat research. So by looking at the pollen, you can by looking at the, the pollen, plants, and that gives you an idea of the the, the climate. That's right. What she, what she, she had a little funnel with a filter on the top. She was collecting the modern, the modern pollen rain, what was currently being deposited, and she was comparing the modern pollen rain from the surrounding plants with the pollen she was getting out of this. And 
apparently every plant has an identifiable, if you know how to do it, has an identifiable, it's a bit like doing skulls of rodents and so on, I can look at it and say, I know what that is. Well, the person who's working in, in the area of, I can't remember the technical term for it, pan- panology or something, anyway, sure. we won't worry about that, but um, they can easily identify plant species, at least the genus, if not to, if not to species. So she was able to compare the modern pollen rain with the pollen rain four and a half thousand years ago or, more, or longer, and to make some deductions about climate. Wow, amazing! Yeah, that is. But it's quite exciting to be able to find them in. Yeah, quite exciting. Just from solidified rat urine from yep. six thousand years ago. There are lots and lots <laughs> of them at Bratchen. I mean, I've seen plenty of tourists just walk past these, and I'm thinking, you don't know what it is. <laughs> You're not taking any interest in it. Yeah. Um, but you, the best place is to look at, get the geological map out, look at the geology. If it's in relief, particularly, if it's, if it's not in relief, it's a bit harder because you need a, a gorge or something to start winding, walking through. But uh, they're the best sites to look for, stickness rat sites. And Bratchener is has a lot of them. Is there many places left unexplored? There are lots of the areas of the Flinders I haven't been into. Yeah, because they're on private, they're on areas that are hard to get to. So there's there's plenty of other areas. E- Erie Cave is a rather spectacular, has a very spectacular midden on the front of it, and that's sort of not that far away from Wilpena Pound actually, but it's in limestone. It's south of Wilkerwillina Gorge, so the limestone at Wilkerwillina Gorge would be the same limestone in, in the, the the range that uh, this particular Erie Cave a- appears in, and that has a really big midden out the front brush tail possum droppings embedded in it, barn owl pellets embedded in it, uh, bones embedded in it from barn owl pellets, and the cave is so, itself is spectacular with lots of stalactites and stalagmites, stalagmites, including faulted where they join together. You can actually see them faulted, where there's obviously been a bit of earth movement up there. So, yeah, that's, that's some spectacular, but it's way, way out of... It's, it's really quite difficult to get to. But uh, I know how to get to it. I was sh- shown how to get there by someone from the lands department who was collecting bones for me from some of the caves in that area. He was going out and doing his surveys of the uh, leases because they have to check that the lessees are doing the right thing but not overstocking and so on and they're, where their watering points are, etc. He uh, started collecting stuff for me and told, said, oh, this cave is interesting. So one year I took my younger son with me and we walked, we walked down to it from uh, Wilkerwell and a Gorge. But uh, it's halfway up a cliff face. It's not the sort of thing you'd expect to find a cave. You expect to find caves down at river level. This is halfway up a cliff face. So there's been a lot of movements of the whole area has been uplifted since that cave started forming, I think. But yeah, the geological maps are really important in trying to find the best areas for studying barn owl roosts and stickness rats deposits. When I think of what I started off at doing, majoring in physical and inorganic chemistry at Adelaide University and organic chemistry and then teaching that at school, of course, and then when, as a teacher, I did biology at university as well, but um, you have to teach all the sciences. And when I took the students to Chambers Gorge, one of the good things about that was the fact that it became obvious to me that you can't pigeonhole these, these sciences. You can't, the biology is related, the, the plants growing in a certain area are related to the, to the soil pH types. The soil pH is related to the rock types. So we used to have our, our geology students doing transects across the lands, landscapes, plotting the geology. We had the biology, biology students actually doing the doing transects, plotting the plants and then looking at changes in the, in the soil types and, and rock types as we went across, and there was this correlation. So the chemistry students were doing soil pH, biology students were doing the plant adaptations and plants, um, and we had chem students doing so, uh, water testing as well. So at the whole of Chambers Gorge, we actually had a series of salinity levels we used to get the kids to work out what the salinity levels were. And when, that, when we had flash floods through the gorge, which we saw a few times, were able to look at what was it before the flash flood, what was the difference after the flash flood. And we realised that the flash floods were critical for reducing the salinity levels of the waterholes that were essential for, for euros to drink from. Because when, 
we had we had one during one drought period we had one of the water holes had 18,000 parts per million of total dissolved solids which is Love pretty the ocean. pretty high <laughs> even higher than the ocean um, or maybe not higher than the ocean but very very high after the, the flash floods had been through it went down to four and a half thousand parts or two two thousand to four and a half thousand parts which is quite drinkable for stock and for kangaroos and so on Humans, not great, still not great for humans, but if I guess the Aboriginal people survived quite well on, on the water from Chambers Gorge because that has an Aboriginal engravings as well. So it's an important Aboriginal site. So that was one of the things that the, we, the students were able to see. There was this cultural aspect as well. We found there's an Aboriginal campsite. We actually found how the Aboriginal people were able to... You, produce their fires with hot rocks they'd put the they'd cook on the on the stones themselves rather than put the, f- the meat in the fire they would heat the stones up on on the fire first and then cook the, the cook the the meat cook the animals singe the fur off and cook them on the rocks hmm. and where the soil was baked hard the pre the erosion since that time has washed away the softer areas and so they they stand out in relief if you know what to look for there's an aboriginal camp fire. there's another one there's another one then you start finding Aboriginal grinding stones and all this sort of thing as well. And last year I took the Waterhouse Club up to Chambers Gorge to go through what I did with my students, basically. A bit modified because these are older people. And we, we went to the Aboriginal campsite area and, f- and found a lot of it that's still there. That the Abrig- they, the wow. grinding stones are too heavy to carry around, so you leave them. If you're going to migrate and move around... You want to know when you get to that site, you've got your grinding stones already there. So it's, it's, once you know what to look for, you just got to have the knowledge to know what to look for. It's all there. So get yeah. out there and get, get out, out there, there and have a look. <laughs> get out with some biologists and, and volunteer and go on some of these field trips. Mate, thank you very much. We know you've got a lot of people out there that are waiting to see you, so we appreciate you giving us your time. Thank and, you. And, um, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. And thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.